I think that during Boris Johnson's Prime Ministership, there was a contempt for Parliament, uh, which was very unfortunate. The test of a functional parliamentary democracy is not whether it stops complete charlatans from getting to the top. Are you saying he is complete charlatan? Yes. I really don't see that the Strasbourg court, which is a very ideological court, is going to reform itself. I once thought that there was some prospect of that, but I've given up on that. This is The Judges, Power, Politics and the People, hosted by the University of Law. This week, I'm speaking with Lord Sumption. Jonathan Sumption broke ground when he was appointed as a Justice of the Supreme Court in 2012, the first appointment to the top of the judiciary to be made directly from the practicing bar. As a barrister, he'd carved out a highly successful career with wide-ranging expertise spanning commercial law, constitutional law and human rights, and appearing in many complex and prominent cases. He was famously once described as having a brain the size of a planet. A historian by background, he has written several books, notably a five-volume count of the 100 Years' War. On retiring from the Supreme Court in 2018, he became a prominent public commentator and writer, expressing often controversial views, such as on the handling of the COVID-19 pandemic. In 2019, he delivered the Wreath Lectures for the BBC, on the theme of law and the decline of politics. I began by asking Lord Sumption whether former judges should speak out on matters of public debate. It depends on the subject. Um, I think that there is absolutely no reason why former judges uh, should not discuss legal issues, many of which will be issues with, in, with uh, political implications. That's the way with the current state of the law. There are many cases that the courts hear which have significant political consequences. I don't think that that means that the judges who decide them are political, it, it, but it, it, it does mean uh, that they may have to speak out on what they think that the law is. Um, so I have no problem, uh, uh, and I don't think anyone else has any problem, about speaking out on legal issues, on constitutional issues in the broadest sense of the word. That, in my case, would include free speech, for example, which I feel strongly about. Um, there are other issues, like COVID, on which I think that, in principle, um, uh, uh, judges should not speak out even after retirement. You, uh, you have, of course, haven't I you? I have, yes. And the reason for that is that I think that there are exceptions to every rule. Uh, my view about uh, the lockdowns uh, was that it had really very significant implications for the relationship between the state and the citizen, which were likely to last very much longer than the pandemic. Uh, I thought that that was a source of real concern. And I think that you always have to say that there are some issues which are so fundamental that they are much more important than any convention about what a judge should or shouldn't say after retirement. I thought that this was such an issue. And I think that on those issues, you have to stand up and be counted. And of course, that, that aside, you, it does, speaking out generally, as you say, because of the decisions, the kind of decisions judges make now, it does mean treading deeper into political waters. Is that well, okay as a former do. judge? Uh, it shouldn't do. I mean, if you're talking about a politically controversial decision, like, for example, the two uh, Gina Miller decisions in the Supreme Court. Um, there is no way that you can discuss that and keep the politics out of it. But there's no reason why, you're, why the, an, a former judge's opinions should discuss the politics at all. That there's no reason why, by saying, for example, that the prorogation decision was right, as I think it was, um, uh, you are necessarily uh, endorsing um, uh, uh, remaining or, or the opposite. There, are, there is a world of difference between saying um, uh, we ought never to have left the EU uh, and saying 
the prorogation decision was a perfectly sound decision, regardless of the Prime Minister's reasons for proroguing Parliament. Uh, and do you think, and I, I, I've heard you speaking on this before, but do you think judges can actually leave their politics at the door of the court? Yes, they do it all the time. There's a lot of public law, particularly in the Supreme Court, and I know uh, from personal experience uh, that uh, there are that, that, that they leave their politics uh, at the door. That's not actually very difficult for most issues. You know, if the issue is a judicial review of an administrative decision about um, immigration or education, etc., uh, you can perfectly easily decide that without having any particular view or without expressing any particular view uh, about the merits of immigration. Um, that's just one example, and it, by and large it's true across the board. I mean, the two Gina Miller decisions touched a very raw nerve because some people believed that they had the capacity to, to derail the whole process and felt very strongly about it, and were, it was very difficult to persuade them that the uh, Supreme Court wasn't making a political decision. But actually, uh, I know uh, what the views about Brexit are of pretty well all my former colleagues, and I'm not going to tell you what they are, uh, but I am going to tell you that they had no, they bore no relationship to the uh, difference between dissent and assent in the first Gina Miller case, or the views expressed by a unanimous Supreme Court in the second one. You've touched on the Gina Miller cases, so let's let's chat a bit about that now. Mm -hmm. um, you you say you knew what the views of your political views of your colleagues were, but they didn't come to bear on the ruling. No. I think some people were surprised about the decision you took in the first one that you sat on. Uh, why should they have been surprised about the decision that I particularly took? I think people suspected that you would be uh, in the minority there. Well, they had no reason to suspect that. They didn't know what my views were on the constitutional issue. I'd never expressed them before. And in some ways, I'd never had to think about them seriously before this case. And what's your view about the unanimity in the second ruling involving the suspension of Parliament? Was that a surprise to you? Uh, uh, no, not particularly. Um, I think that that may have been, I mean, obviously I'm not privy to the way that the deliberations went, but I think that it may have been because of the particular ground on which uh, the government lost, um, which in my view wasn't the most satisfactory ground. It may be that the, most sat the more satisfactory ground would have been more controversial within the court. But let me explain what I mean. The government grossly mishandled uh, the, uh, uh, the whole case. What they should have done, if they wanted to put their best foot forward, was to go in saying, uh, well, everybody agrees that it is the function of the government and not of parliament to negotiate with the EU. It's a very delicate diplomatic situation. Uh, we cannot be expected to have uh, a successful discussion with the diplomats of the EU if we have all this background noise in parliament undermining our negotiating position all the time. That's what, in my view, they should have said, and there would have been no reputable case for that argument. Uh, instead of which they said, oh, this is absolutely nothing to do with negotiations. It's all a matter of efficient time management. They felt they had to say that because Boris Johnson had sent a circular announcing his decision to prorogue um, uh, to all members of parliament in both houses. And that made this claim, which was perfectly absurd, that it was all a matter of efficient time management. When it came to the actual hearing, uh, they didn't put in any evidence at all. Uh, uh, so uh, the Supreme Court uh, was able to say, well, they have to have a good reason, and they haven't put forward any reason, so they lose. And uh, I believe uh, that they were given what I would regard as the correct advice, uh, but rejected it because it would have been inconsistent with some of the public statements that had emerged from number 10. Uh, I I haven't got cast iron evidence for that, but I think that it is so. Advice uh, from the uh, lawyers? I think that they, I would be astonished uh, if the uh, English and Scottish law officers had not advised them that that was the right course to take. It would also, in all probability, have been the truthful course to take. Um, so, so given that they didn't, it's not really a surprise that's, I'm to sure you. that's one reason why it was unanimous. Uh, it, unfortunately... I think that the, that particular ground of decision 
is rather difficult to justify. Because if you say that you can't prorogue except when there's good reason, what happens if the next time they do put forward a reason? It's almost certain to be a political reason, uh, like the reason that I think that they should, if they'd been truthful, have offered to the court. Um, uh, how is the court going to resolve that? It's, it will inevitably end up uh, by saying, by having to decide whether an essentially political judgment is uh, a reasonable one or not. Uh, I think it would be very unfortunate if the courts were to make a decision like that. Uh, and I'm sure that they would run a mile without doing it. They didn't have to because of the government's mishandling of Gina Miller number two. Um, uh, but they might have done and they might do next time. It would have been much more satisfactory, I think, to say that if, you, uh, if the government had won that case, it would have left a, a serious constitutional void. It would have meant that a public power, which is what the prorogation power is, would have been exercised without the government being answerable to anybody. Not to Parliament, because it would have been prorogued. Not to the electorate, because there was not to be an election for another three years or so. Not to the monarch, because by convention the monarch's prerogative powers are exercised by her ministers. So what you would have done is to transform a public power uh, of the prime minister into a private privilege. Uh, I think that the common law has never accepted uh, that uh, a public power can be exercised uh, entirely without respons constitutional responsibility to anyone at all. Uh, so it was, it was a right ruling, in your it, view, by the court and, and held the I've executive I've got misgivings about the reason because the reason was only relevant in that particular case. And in another case, the government will probably get its ducks in a row rather more skillfully than they did last time. I mean, one strange feature of it, it was the, uh, the, the overruling of the Lord Chief Justice himself in that case. Was well, he wrong? I think so. I think so. Because uh, I think the answer was pretty obvious, uh, given the way the government conducted the case. Can I take you back now to your early life in the bar? Why did you? And tell me a little bit about where you grew up. And uh, I know where you went to school. You went to Eton and you went to Morton College. Where did you grow up? And did you have law in the family? No, my father had been a solicitor uh, after he was demobilised at the end of the war. Where did uh, he practice? Uh, he practiced in London in uh, a small uh, niche firm where he took over from two elderly partners who wanted to retire. So he was effectively a sole practitioner, but then took on a few partners. But he stopped being a solicitor in the early 1950s uh, and went into a form of investment banking. Um, and that was reasonably successful uh, for a while, uh, but then um, uh, spectacularly crashed and my father was I think pretty lucky to get out with with his shirt still on his back. So um, that wasn't an influence, he, his going into law or being in the law wasn't an influence. Well my on father then went back into law because after his uh, business uh, had basically collapsed uh, he read for the bar and became um, a specialist in tax uh, and he practiced at the bar for nearly a decade before definitively retiring. So he had two phases of law. So you, you did have some insight into Yes, but by then, the you world. Know, uh, by the time he became a barrister, I was in my 20s and um, intent on other things. You read history. Yes. And what encouraged you then to leave and become a barrister? Or to well, you know, the honest answer to that is that it was the money. Uh, I didn't want to be enormously rich, but I didn't want to be a bit better off than uh, a junior academic, uh, even at a wonderful university like Oxford. Um, I can think of better reasons, but they're all afterthoughts. <laughs> so you, you obviously had a very successful career at the bar and uh, moving swiftly then to your decision to go onto the bench. Why did you make that decision? Well, I had in fact declined to go to uh, accept appointment to the High Court uh, on a number of occasions. Um, and um, uh, that was because I felt that uh, I, I was very much enjoying 
practicing at the bar at the level at which I was practicing, uh, I didn't uh, find very attractive the prospect of going down to the bottom of another ladder and then um, finding myself hearing a lot of cases which I wouldn't have touched with a barge pole as a barrister. Um, now, that may be rather a selfish view, but I mean, inevitably, career choices are ultimately choices about what one's going to enjoy doing, because if you don't enjoy doing it, the chances are you won't do it very well. Um, then uh, I uh, got a broad hint uh, that an application for the Supreme Court uh, would be not, they didn't say welcomed, but certainly uh, looked on favorably, uh, uh, taken seriously. Uh, so I decided, um, I decided to apply. As a matter of fact, I very nearly missed the deadline because I'm not a, a, an assiduous uh, watcher of the sits vac columns in the newspapers. <laughs> um, uh, it was only when I bumped into the um, one of the administrators at the then prospective Supreme Court who said that they were rather surprised uh, that somebody in my chambers had applied for the, ap for the application documents um, that, who seemed to be unaware that he was um, uh, well over the uh, retirement age. This, of course, was Sidney Kentridge. Uh, and the, the secret was, and he came into my room, this was the day before the deadline, and, and said effectively, sign here. <laughs> uh, <laughs> otherwise, I would have missed it. You would have missed it. In fact, it wasn't a completely straightforward thing, was yes, it, as I recall. Wasn't. There no. was quite a lot of controversy about it. Yeah. Uh, there was a little bit of toing and froing behind the scenes. There was a lot of opposition among court well, of appeal I applied judges. twice. You applied twice, and yes. And the first time uh, I was uh, uh, told that I would be uh, selected, uh, but the court of appeal cut up rough. Uh, and uh, no announcement had ever been made, so that was fine. The uh, exercise was rerun, uh, and I wasn't sh even shortlisted the second time. I don't think they wanted a repetition of the previous row. So that was fine. I, I mean, it did, did a lot of damage to my practice because the publicity uh, associated with it when the news leaked out that I'd applied um, uh, basically meant that people stopped instructing me. So as soon as I realized that I wasn't going to be selected on the rerun, I made a public announcement that I was withdrawing because that was the only way that I was going to solve my practice. Yes. Um, some time later, in fact, uh, nearly two years later, uh, I, it was suggested to me um, that I might want to apply again. And I... Um, asked whether the, they were actually seriously prepared to entertain yes. an application well, from somebody who wasn't an existing judge, because I saw no point in applying again if the policy was uh, that they were not going to accept somebody who wasn't already in the Court of Appeal. Um, uh, anyway, I formed the view uh, that the atmosphere had changed. I applied and we know what happened. Well, it, bro it broke new ground. And uh, did you encounter much hostility then from people? P were colleagues resentful? Absolutely not. That you not. came in directly from yeah. the bar? I, I mean. received absolutely no hostility whatever from within the Supreme Court. Uh, and I actually had some very um, uh, uh, reassuring um, statements from some of the people who had been hostile to my appointment two years earlier. Um, and so that passed, you know, without really any difficulty at all. Uh, as I got into my stride in the Supreme Court and started writing uh, my share of the judgments, I think people broadly accepted that this was fine. You had a contribution to make. And yeah. how did you enjoy it? It's obviously oh, it's extremely one, different from the, the work you'd been doing. It's the best judicial job in the world. Uh, or at least in the British world. Um, it, the, the Supreme Court enjoys uniquely uh, favorable conditions for writing seriously considered judgments. We are not placed under pressure of time. Uh, we are able much more easily than Court of Appeal judges or puny judges to say, you know, I need longer to do this or I need more time 
um, away from hearings to do this. It, it's a uh, it's a court which is the whose, whose administration is basically controlled by the judges themselves. Uh, so it, it works extremely well. It also works at another level because it's a highly deliberative court. Uh, we don't, as was once the practice, um, certainly before the Supreme Court was created, we don't simply hand down our judgments like tablets of Moses and discover, rather to our surprise, uh, whether we are in a minority or a majority. <laughs> we exchange drafts, uh, we comment on each other's drafts, we negotiate compromises um, in order to produce the, 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 the best possible consensus. It's very deliberative. And that, I think, is very much in the public interest. Did you get into any serious tussles with any of your colleagues over any particular decisions? Uh, well, I'm not going to disclose which ones, but certainly there were cases uh, in which... Uh, there were very few cases in which tempers rose, though there were one or two. Um, <laughs> did you have to back down in your views on anything? Oh, I frequently did that. Uh, <laughs> I didn't... I mean, uh, it would be... I think I can only remember one case in which I actually changed the way that I voted as a result of um, discussions or drafts from other colleagues. Uh, but it was very common to find that one could express something better or that there were better reasons than the ones one had given. Um, and you have to be prepared uh, to take into account other people's views, not only because they, their views might actually be more logically compelling than the one that you had first arrived at. You also have to do it because uh, arguing about the, uh, the finer points of the reasoning between people who basically have arrived at the same conclusion is rather unproductive. It muddies the waters and leads to unclear judgments. Uh, and I think that that is against the public interest, so that there is another reason uh, for endeavouring to conform one's view as far as possible. Uh, to yes. those of colleagues who basically have arrived at the same ultimate conclusion, whether okay. it should be yes or no. Do you feel, uh, looking at your two uh, careers, if I can put it like that, wh where do you think you had most influence as a highly successful advocate, bringing a very large number and winning them of, of leading cases? I lost cases too. Oh, um, you did, I'm sure. Or on the Supreme Court as a very influential justice. Where do you think you had most influence? Um, well, uh, obviously one has more influence over the results of decisions in which one is sitting, even if one's only 20% of the panel deciding the case. Um, I think that uh, ad uh, good advocacy rarely um, wins cases, but bad advocacy frequently loses them. Um, the impact of good advocacy is basically to draw the court's attention to the best that can be said for a particular point of view, uh, to ensure that things are not overlooked. Um, but ultimately, I have enough respect for the quality of the judiciary in, in this country to believe that the result um, would have been the same. Um, whether one had been a good advocate or a mediocre one. Well, I think you're being very modest. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're going to be persuaded by good advocacy, I'm sure, like anybody else. Can I ask you, you, you spoke quite a bit, um, not least in your wreath lectures, about the um, vacuum that the courts have filled to some extent um, by politicians not necessarily being bold enough to take decisions in controversial social areas and others. Do you, do you tell me a bit about that. Do you think the Supreme Court has become too political? No, I don't think it's political at all. Um, I think that judges often start with a certain instinct. It's a social instinct rather than a political instinct about um, fairness and the way that, for example, minorities should be treated. And there's a long liberal tradition in the English judiciary, which is not at all recent. It goes back very, very many years. Um, uh, but that doesn't amount to political decision-making. Uh, all judges start from a hypothesis about what, the, what the, their instinctive answer would be. But you then test it uh, against the facts, you test it against the legal principles, you test it 
against logical coherence. And if you find that your hypothesis starts getting a bit battered, you change your mind. That's how it works. Nobody starts from a blank sheet of paper, uh, but they end up uh, in the best place, I think, by being prepared to be rigorous about their initial instincts. I think, I suppose, what I'm, I mean more is, are they taking decisions of a political nature that they should not really be taking? Uh, I think that there have been cases like that, and I spoke about this on this subject in my Reith lectures. Um, uh, I think that there were decisions like the decision about the Prince of Wales' letters, for example, uh, which I found extremely difficult. Shall we just say to, uh, what that decision was to, to release the letters that uh, were, had been confidential? Yes, I mean, the, the Act clearly stated that the, uh, the Secretary of State or the Attorney General had a, a veto, and we know that this was politically what was intended uh, because the, uh, the way that it passed through Parliament. Um, but uh, the courts have always been extremely suspicious of any attempt to confer on, a, on a, a, a minister or an administrator a power which they think should belong to them. Uh, and there has been a tendency, another example I think was Privacy International, uh, a decision about uh, whether you could judicially review uh, dis certain decisions of the uh, Special uh, Immigration Appeal Tribunal. Uh, you know, I think that that was very difficult to justify. I dissented. Um, but these are not political decisions. These are basically decisions uh, in which the court is defending what it regards as the jurisdiction it ought to have, even if statute has said it doesn't. And I don't approve of that. And did, as I said, in, you know, in certainly in the Privacy International case, I wasn't sitting on the Prince of Wales Letters case. Um, uh, but naturally I had views about it. But these aren't really political decisions. There have been other cases in which I think that, the, that judicial activism had gone too far. But I think that there's always, in the way that courts work, a movement to and fro, uh, a, a process of action and reaction. And at the moment, I think that the Supreme Court has done an extremely good job in checking these tendencies just in the last year and a half to two years. Um, there have been two important Supreme Court cases, one involving Shamima Begum and the other in a decision about the Child Poverty Action Group's action involving um, the decisions about social security payments. Uh, in both of those cases, the Supreme Court emphasized uh, that there are many things which in a democracy uh, ministers have to be responsible to Parliament for. They cannot be responsible uh, to the courts uh, without um, uh, cutting across lines of responsibility which in a constitutional democracy are very fundamental. Uh, that's a principle which I think the courts had tended to lose sight of. And I think at the moment what we are seeing is a valuable corrective to the previous enthusiasm uh, of courts for interfering with political judgments. You uh, think we, it's gone back a little? I think it's gone back to more or less the right place. So uh, the balance, the current balance between the judiciary, the executive and parliament, a delicate balance, would you say it's about right? I think it is about right now. Uh, I think that uh, at the time when I left the Supreme Court, uh, the balance was too hostile uh, to the executive. And I think that the corrective is therefore valuable. It has, of course, caused howls of objection. When you say uh, the balance was too hostile to the executive, you mean the judges tended to make rulings which were too uh, critical of the executive? Yes. They did it too frequently or they...? They did it too frequently and on issues uh, which essentially involved political judgments of the kind of which the courts are not the proper arbiters. Can you, have you got a particular case in mind you can well, cite? Um, uh, I, I mean, I would, I would want to choose my cases rather more carefully than I can do in, a, in an informal interview like this. Um, but uh, I, I certainly think that although the courts in the, for example, the Prince of Wales letters case, were concerned mainly not with the political aspect of it, uh, but with 
uh, the constitutional implications of ha making a minister the judge of, what the, of the public interest, uh, it seems to me that that was a case in which the court was too hostile to the executive. Uh, maybe for non-political reasons, but nonetheless too hostile. There are lots of cases in which uh, a minister is a better judge of the public interest than a judge. Uh, I'm not suggesting by any means that all cases are like that, but very many are, and that may be because uh, the executive has a far wider range of information available to it uh, than the special interest groups who tend to get involved in public law litigation. Or it may be um, uh, because um, uh, ministers are responsible to parliament for their um, judgments of the public interest and can be thrown out if they get it badly wrong. Yes. Do you think you're unusual, though? I think you are, aren't you? A bit of an outlier in your attitude to the executive compared with some of your former colleagues. Well, it's not actually an attitude to the executive. Uh, I've expressed it in terms of hostility to the executive. But uh, my prime concern is not with protecting the executive, but with protecting the role of parliament as the body to which ministers are properly accountable for most of their decisions. Um, I, it seems to me that the role of parliament is fundamental in any democracy, but particularly in a democracy like ours, uh, in which uh, we do not have directly elected heads of government or heads of state, uh, and Parliament is the uh, essential sounding board for, for all public policy. Have, have we seen a change in attitude in recent years within the executive to the parliamentary process or indeed the rule of law? Well, the rule of law is, is too elastic a concept for me to be able to answer that question without a lot more pre uh, precision. I was going to actually ask you to summarise the rule I mean, of law, the... but that's probably impossible. <laughs> well, uh, but anyway. Uh, the attitude of ministers to uh, parliamentary process, the rule of law generally. I think that during Boris Johnson's um, prime ministership, uh, there was a contempt for parliament, uh, which was very unfortunate. Uh, I mean, it was summed up in the statement which um, uh, Geoffrey Cox, in many ways an extremely uh, responsible um, and moderate uh, uh, lawyer when he was Attorney General. But you may remember that in September 2019, he solemnly told the House of Commons that they had no right to be sitting there because they were getting in the way of the government's negotiating policy about Brexit. Now, whatever you think about Brexit, the suggestion that MPs uh, have, it's none of the business of MPs to hold the government to account for the way they conduct the negotiations was frankly utterly ridiculous. Uh, I think that Boris Johnson did have a contempt for Parliament. He did feel that, that he had a personal mandate, which is not the constitutional doctrine. Uh, he may have been a large part of the reason why the uh, Tories won a large majority uh, in December 2019, but that does not mean that the mandate is to him, uh, as opposed to the general body of MPs to whom he was responsible. We saw this again when, uh, within hours before uh, he ultimately was forced to resign, uh, he started complaining uh, that, given his personal mandate, uh, it was completely outrageous for MPs to get rid of him. Uh, I think that the test of a democracy, functional democracy, and particularly a functional parliamentary democracy, uh, is not whether it stops uh, uh, completely, complete charlatans from getting to the top. Are you saying he is a complete charlatan? Yes. Um, uh, I think the test is whether uh, it um, enables them to get rid of him once the mistakes are discovered. And it did. It did, as, as it did with his successor. Um, I mean, I think that is parliamentary government at work. We don't have a presidential system. If we did have a presidential system, we would need a lot more checks and balances, which we lack precisely because we have a parliamentary system. One of the, the, th the fallouts from Brexit is ministers looking repeatedly at the European Convention of Human Rights and whether we should come out of it. 
What's mm-hmm. your view about that? Well, I've expressed my view that we should come out of it. It's a view that I've come to uh, recently and reluctantly. But I think the first point to make is that the ECHR issue and the European Union issue are completely different. The European Union uh, is a classic example of an arrangement by treaty under which sovereign states uh, collaborate to do something which they are not capable of doing individually in that case, creating one of the largest single markets in the world. Now, you might or might not think that that was a sufficient advantage uh, to justify the um, the, the, uh, the ceding of sovereignty involved. Uh, I'm not going to get into that. Um, uh, but uh, that is the reason why you normally enter into a multilateral treaty. The ECHR is completely different. The ECHR is a treaty governing the contents of our domestic law. Everything that is is in the ECHR, we can do legislatively ourselves with no cooperation at all. And we should do, in your opinion. Uh, I think that we should do, certainly now. The problem, uh, I think it's very important how how we do it. Uh, I would not be in favour of leaving the ECHR unless we substituted for it something which was functionally equivalent, except that it would not be subject uh, to the uh, jurisdiction of the Strasbourg Court. A, Brit- a British Bill of Rights? Exactly. That, that is what I think we should aim for. Uh, uh, this is a minority position in England. I have no doubt about that. But that's because people uh, say to themselves, uh, do I like this, that or the other decision of the Strasbourg Court? And many of them are perfectly admirable decisions. But that's not the issue. The issue is how should one make law for a democracy? And the problem about the Strasbourg Court is that it has, since the 1970s, emancipated itself from the text of the Convention, which is the only thing that the states have ever agreed, and uh, given itself a roving brief over large parts of the whole range uh, of social policy uh, in respects which are not covered by the Convention. It may well be that the Convention needs to be updated, but it isn't the function of a judge to update it. It's the function of politicians and statesmen in the countries of the Council of Europe. If you have an institution which uh, ignores the mandate, the limited mandate given to it by the states, uh, and uh, cuts across the demarcation and the lines of responsibility essential to a democracy, I think that you should pause and ask yourself whether this is a sensible way to behave. Mm. I've only recently come to the... but had the view that we should actually take the extreme step of leaving it. But I really don't see that the Strasbourg court, which is a very ideological court, is going to reform itself. I once thought that there was some prospect of that, but I've given up on them. Well, as we speak, the um, Supreme Court is, is looking at the government's appeal over removing illegal asylum seekers to Rwanda. Mm. Um, we don't know which way they're going to rule. Have you got a view on that? What do you think they should well, decide? Uh, I, I, I don't have a view on what they should decide because uh, it's, there's very little law in it. It's essentially a question of fact. The issue is whether Rwanda is safe or not. There's a very large volume of evidence before the court uh, and I haven't read that evidence. So I am not going to pronounce on what the result might be. Uh, I would have every confidence that whatever the result, uh, it will be soundly based on the evidence. It might find the Supreme Court justices once again under attack or criticism from certain quarters of the public or press, as they were previously in the Gina Miller case. Well, what do you what do you feel about that? I mean, do you think the public has a doesn't really understand what the judges are seeking to do, or? I think the pub, any member of the public who wants to understand what the Supreme Court is doing or trying to do, uh, it can do so. Um, I think one of the striking things about uh, Gina Miller number one is that the famous uh, Daily Mail headline, Enemies of the People, was about the divisional court's decision from which the appeal lay to the Supreme Court. Nothing equivalent happened after that. Now, I don't think this was because the headline writers in the Daily Mail uh, suddenly had an access of conscience uh, or rethought their position. I think the main reason for it was that the proceedings were televised. Anybody uh, who chose 
to tune in. And there were, of course, extracts um, on the news and in some extended news coverage programs. Anybody who wanted to tune in would have found that whereas he might have been expecting impassioned political declarations, what he actually found was there we were sitting uh, grinding through cases in, decided in 1916 about crown leases <laughs> in wartime. Very dry. Uh, but absolutely, and that's how it should be. Yes. This is a, this is a, that was an issue of law. Yes. Um, so do you think I think Sorry. that the televising of the proceedings has made an enormous difference uh, to the public reception of judicial decisions. That's what I wanted to ask you. Yeah. Do you, do you and you think it's a good, obviously yeah. it's a good I thing. I think it's the main reason why most people uh, in fact, accepted uh, the decision in Gina, num Gina Miller number one. Um, they were much better informed on the subject. And, you know, that, that's as it should be. You're in favour of televising uh, court proceedings, are you? Yes. In general? I, mean, I, well, I, I wouldn't want to sentence. televise all court proceedings. But court proceedings in appellate courts about questions of law, uh, I think that there's everything to be said. Uh, for televising them, but particularly, uh, it, I mean, we don't want we don't want wall to wall coverage of court proceedings. People are entitled to be entertained, and that's not the best way of being entertained. <laughs> um, uh, but I think that there's a strong case uh, for televising the proceedings of the top court, uh, and very possibly of the Court of Appeal as well. I would not want to see televising of witness evidence. I think. Uh, the experience of televising U.S. criminal proceedings, O.J. Simpson is an obvious example, uh, suggests that it has a, a, a very damaging effect, both on the impression that it gives to the public, because it gives the impression that this is actually essentially a, a sort of formalized lynch mob, um, uh, which it isn't. Uh, and because I think that witnesses who are being televised, and in particular barristers who are being televised, behave in a way that is slightly different and rather less helpful. We now have, of course, a, a, a woman Lord Chief Justice. Um, you got into a bit of trouble a few years ago, suggesting it would take 50 years, I think, before we had proper diversity and equality on the bench. Yes. Well, when you say I got into a bit of trouble, you mean people disagreed? They disagreed yeah. loudly. Okay. Um, <laughs> do you, do you, have you changed your view? I mean, what difference will it make, if any, having a woman at the helm of the judiciary? Well, the Chief Justice doesn't, of course, choose judges. Um, I mean, the first thing you've got to realise is that... Uh, even if you ensured that, say, 50% of judges were women uh, every time that there was a selection process at the Judicial Appointments Commission, it would take quite a few years to produce 50% of the, of the judiciary being women. So mere mathematics is going to ensure that it's going to take at least 20 years. Um, there is a, a, a serious problem, as I tried to point out, about the high dropout rate of women um, from, uh, uh, from the legal professions, uh, which is the source, of course, from which judges are appointed. Um, for some time now, uh, women have been at least 50% of the recruits, and actually rather more than 50% of the recruits, uh, to both the solicitor's profession and the bar. Uh, when you looked, however, at the most senior levels, at QCs and at candidates for appointment to the bench, the proportion of women is much lower. Um, now, uh, that, if you look at the appointments of judges to the circuit bench or the tribunals, the diversity picture is actually rather good. The proportion of women is, is pretty high. The higher you go, uh, up the judicial hierarchy to the appellate courts, the high courts, and the Supreme Court, uh, the less satisfactory the position appears to be. But the reason for that is that these people are being selected from the top levels of a profession which has an extremely high dropout rate for women. Um, and um, that is not going to change because it's uh, in, a, in a hurry. It, the reason being that it's actually dependent on really profound societal habits um, that die very slowly. Um, for example, 
the uh, willingness of married couples to share uh, childcare duties equally. Uh, that is something that will make much more difference to the availability of suitable women to appoint as judges than any other single thing that I can think of. Uh, yet it's completely unamenable to administrative or legislative control. Um, uh, we are moving there. And actually, I think we are probably moving there faster than I envisaged uh, <laughs> when, as you say, I got into trouble. Uh, but, you know, we are still, it's still going to take time. Take you time. cannot take really profound societal changes like the one that we have experienced over 70 years or so on the role of women in public life uh, and expect to turn up with a magic bullet and solve the problem straight away. That was all that I was seeking to point out. Yes. So the bruja was really a bit absurd. <laughs> Finally, um, then, just a couple of questions. We've got, we touched on the balance of power between the arms of the Constitution, and I think you said you thought it was, it was about right. At I the mean, moment, it, I, think, I do think that. Is it, is it for the future? Is it something you fear might be at risk? I know we're not going to ever be, hopefully, down the, going down the Israeli route of the yeah. government wanting to uh, determine judicial appointments, but... Uh, do, are there risks that of course, we, our of course constitution there are. faces? And the reason why there are risks is that all constitutions, and particularly informal constitutions like ours, um, depend to a very large extent uh, on a culture uh, of respect, not just for the letter of the law, but for the spirit of the constitution, a desire to make things, uh, the, a feeling that for the system to work, is more important than to win on any one issue. Um, I think that that culture uh, took a knock uh, during uh, the uh, Johnson Prime Ministership. Uh, and, and I think that things have improved a great deal since then. Um, but because uh, our constitutional norms are so sensitive to cultural changes, there is always a risk uh, that things might change for the worse. I don't actually think that it will happen at any rate any time soon, because I think that um, what we have witnessed in the last few years is actually a vindication of the notion that constitutional values really do matter, and that uh, politicians, however senior, who ignore them, lose their jobs. And more globally, I, I do think there's a worry about liberal democracy across the world. Yes, I do. Um, I think it will probably survive, but I think that the main problems faced by liberal democracy are a, a growing intolerance uh, of, uh, of dissent. Um, and without dissent, there is frankly no truth, because the truth emerges from a conflict of ideas uh, and not from an imposition of ideas by one or other side in a particular debate. I think that is the main challenge uh, to democracy. Uh, it's particularly significant because uh, the, the, um, the mood that I've described is strongest among the young, uh, who are the generation that is currently taking over. Uh, and that is a serious problem. I have to say that I think that the situation is much worse in the United States than it is here but it's not a happy situation in either place. This podcast was brought to you by the University of Law. Subscribe now to make sure you don't miss the next episode.